from this lecture we will start our discussion on neutron reflectometry till now we have discussed mesoscopic structure studies using neutrons at low q range i have gone through the experiment that you can do uh, using long wavelength neutrons because you will be working at low q lower q range lower q range lower q range or momentum transfer range now another leg of this mesoscopic structure studies are thin films and multi layers where we will be using the technique of neutron reflectometry this is an extremely important tool in hands of experimentalists at present especially for magnetic thin films because since the discovery of giant magneto resistance a lot of work is getting done in the field of thin films and their magnetism interface coupling interface magnetic moment so on and so forth and all these techniques can be all these experiments or characterizations can be done using neutron reflectometry neutron reflectometry and x ray reflectometry are very close they are close cousins as experiments very similar and can be done on the same sample provided the density is allowed so i will also be discussing x ray reflectometry partly with you and we will show that x ray reflectometry and neutron reflectometry can be used for understanding structure mesoscopic structure of thin films in terms of density thickness interface roughness etc etc both of these can be used but in addition polarized neutron reflectometry can be used for same things but with a magnetic magnetic term in front so magnetic density magnetic layer thickness etc and also magnetic roughness in the first part of my lectures i will be discussing specular neutron and x ray whenever required reflectometry of specular reflectometry is something which i will take towards the end so let me quickly tell you specular reflectometry is something in which we use snell's law where the angle of reflection just as we have learned from optics in our school that angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection that is known as specular in case of off specular we talk about diffuse reflection that means the angle of incidence theta i theta i is possibly not equal to angle of reflection theta r so in case of specular theta i is equal to theta r and most of the time we'll be discussing specular neutron reflectometry and there are i'll take examples for off specular off specular which is also interesting study la when theta i is not equal to theta i as an example i might tell you that reflection from a mirror reflection from a mirror that we see every day is specular specular uh reflection reflection from a movie screen screen is of specular because a movie screen the image is seen from all angles so there is nothing like an angle of incidence and angle of reflection equality 
whereas in case of a mirror you can see the image only when you are at a position where you are satisfying angle of incidence equal to angle of reflection so this is the broad difference between specular and off specular when i will be discussing initially the specular reflectometry so but before i get into the discussion proper i want to point out to you uh, this uh, small difference between uh, experiments in the reactor hall and experiments in the guide halls please note that so far we have been discussing large q experiments large q large momentum transfer experiment so we have a powder diffraction we have discussed powder powder diffraction 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 we have discussed single crystal diffraction and magnetic diffraction and also also liquid and amorphous liquid and amorphous these are all liquid and amorphous spectrometry is on the other side of the required reactor block in thruva so all these the q ranges are large large q ranges broadly i can categorize that experiments which you do inside the reactor hall are in the large q range so 4 pi by lambda sin theta so we use shorter lambda and for the guide hall we have reserved experiments which are done at low q so 4 pi by lambda sin theta small angle and longer wavelength why so because these guides that you see they transport neutrons through total external reflection just like a mirror and the guides preferably prefer prefer cold neutrons or neutrons which have wavelength longer than typical new thermal neutrons in the higher energy and that's why like this this particular guide it has got a critical angle of critical wavelength of 2.2 angstrom and there's a guide on the other side which critical angle is 3 angstrom by critical angle i mean the transmission of the guide transmission of the guide it depends on lambda if it's a curved guide and one guide i can draw like this so its transmission goes up like this and this is 2.2 angstrom for one guide and 3 angstrom for other guide so it is better to do experiments using neutrons in this range using the guide holes so in general everywhere this partitioning you will find that long wavelength long wavelength wavelength experiments experiments are done at guide hall guide halls and short wavelength wavelength at reactor hall there are exceptions to this there are thermal guides it is always preferable to go to the guide hall because of very good signal to noise ratio in case of the reactor hall the signal to noise ratio is small because they have high noise high noise whereas in case of a guide hall you have low noise low number of background neutrons and signal to noise ratio improves so it is preferable to do experiments in the guide hall in general but because guides transfer long wavelength neutrons preferably the low q or long wavelength experiments are preferred to be set up in the guide hall with this much i'll go back to 
reflectometry. So this is the reflectometer in Dhruva, but I will discuss other instruments also all over the world, but what kind of studies we can do with them. So let's come back to reflection. Reflection is a phenomena which is our daily experience. I have just uh, shown you some photographic image of reflection of trees in water. Now you can see from here to here as I travel. One qualitative uh, comment that I can make that the water surface is smooth here, slightly less smooth here and rough here. So I can talk about roughness in a qualitative term, roughness of the surface. So from the reflection, I can make a qualitative comment about the surface, that the surface is more rough or less rough. And sometimes I can say it's a very bad surface, maybe there is roughness, not roughness, but the surface may be wavy at macroscopic length scale. So, but these are all what I showed you at a qualitative scale. But when we do neutron reflectometry, different from optical reflections that is visible to the naked eye, neutrons and X-rays can also be reflected. Because neutrons have a de Broglie wavelength lambda and X-rays are electromagnetic. So both of these, they are waves and reflection is the property of waves, refraction. So they can be reflected, refracted, but with certain constrictions I will come to. So neutron and X-ray reflectometry both can determine structure for both neutron and X-rays. Categorically magnetic when you use neutron, polarized neutron reflectometry. Information of thin films and interfaces at mesoscopic length scales. So I will talk about a film which may be uh, 100 angstrom 100 angstrom thick and magnetic moment may be uh, say I can say per, per 10 angstrom thickness roughness may be 1 to 10 angstrom so these are quantifying parameters at a mesoscopic length scale but both these experiments are at near grazing incidence and that's why it's difficult. So before I get into that, let me just quickly tell you that what is the difficulty in, we have seen that in case of small angle, we use a very narrow beam, narrow beam and the sample is in transmission mode, transmission mode, transmission mode. Whereas in case of X-ray and neutron reflectometry, we have a thin film, most probably, mostly on a substrate. This is a thin film, I'm exaggerating. And I have to put it in a reflection mode in a narrow beam. So the beam is narrow because the angle, the average angle with respect to the surface is of the order of tens of arc minutes to maybe a degree and this beam can be as narrow as few arc minutes arc minutes so the instrument needs one a narrow beam narrow beam often much narrower than what we use in a sans instrument and Alignment of the sample, alignment of the sample, that is very important. Alignment of the sample, sample in the beam. So these are the difficulties because when you make a narrow beam, you cut down the intensity of neutrons, so you have what lesser number of neutrons and when you have such a narrow beam, so you have an, let me just decide, 
let's show it like a line like this I need to align my sample in the beam I have to bring it in a beam at a certain angle so that I can see a reflected beam and the reflection angle itself also can be questioned unless we have means of answering that one is the angle of reflection and second is how to bring the sample in the beam because the sample is maybe 100 nanometer thick and it needs to be placed in the beam by moving the substrate. So these are the challenges with respect to a neutron reflectometer. Interestingly, historically, I feel like sharing this with you because this is a major technique today. Uh, what one could say about X-rays and neutrons, the discoverer of X-rays, Ron Jane, the first Nobel laureate, you look at his comment in 1895. The question as to reflection of the X-ray may be regarded as settled by the experiments mentioned in the preceding, preceding paragraph in favor of the view that no noticeable regular reflection of the rays take place from any of the substances examined. Other experiments which I omit lead to the same conclusion. So, he said that the X-rays cannot be reflected. This is December 28, 1895. This is the year when he, I think, that is the year when X-rays were discovered. But this technique was rediscovered in 1954 and re-established as a technique. So, so far as neutron is concerned, historically, Fermi and Zinn in 1946 were the first to present neutron reflectometry measurements for finding out coherent nuclear scattering. Why it is so? I will tell you, coherent nuclear scattering. Uh, it can be found out using a neutron reflectometry and approximately a decade later the first report on X-ray reflectivity actually following the comment by Ron Jen later in 1954 we get the classic paper by Parrot where surface studies of solid by total reflection of X-rays. So X-rays can be reflected and this is a classic paper which is followed by almost entire thin field community those who attempt to do the X-ray reflectometry. So what Parrot says in 1954 analysis of the shape of the curve of reflected X-rays. So basically the case how Ronjen missed reflection because he didn't realize that the refractive index of X-rays is almost 1. I will come to it briefly. But if you can take care of the beam that has to be very very narrow and if you can take care of the angles that you can measure then it say this paper says analysis of the shape of the curve of reflected x-rays intensity versus glancing angle in the region of total reflection provides a new method of studying certain structural properties of the mirror surface about to several hundred angstroms d using dispersion theory extended to treat number of stratified homogeneous media is used as a basis of interpretation this classic paper not only provides with experimental results but also with the formalism that we used even today to analyze or fit x-ray and neutron reflectometry data obtained from our instruments. So, X-rays and neutrons, uh, they give us non-destructive tools for thin film characterization in as reflectometry. So, here as I mentioned earlier that the refractive index for X-rays and neutrons can be written as n equal to 1 minus delta. So, <coughs> what is the value of the delta I will come to in later part. But I want to point out to you that this delta value, this delta is very very small. So, one is that 
n is marginally less than 1 for neutrons <coughs> and x-rays and then what it means let me compare this with what I find in general optics you are familiar that let us say water water has a refractive index around 1.33 in case of optics we use the angle with respect to the normal to the interface between the two mediums so if it is water it is air <coughs> when light ray comes out from water to air it undergoes total internal reflection that means as I keep increasing this angle at some angle the refracted beam goes along the boundary and beyond that it reflects back inside the medium it cannot come out from water this is known as total internal reflection just as opposite to this if n is less than 1 then every medium the medium has a lesser refractive index compared to the vacuum or air we will consider air as vacuum or air so in that case when the ray comes from vacuum inside the medium just the same thing happens in the opposite direction at the interface I am not able to draw it properly let me exaggerate it it under, undergoes a change in direction this and up to a certain angle as we go, go to larger angles that means if this angle is smaller this angle is larger then it undergoes total external reflection total external external reflection so because the refractive index is less than 1 I have total external reflection and let me point out right at the onset unlike optics which you studied in our school days in this case I will consider the angle with respect to the surface and not with respect to the normal so that means as I go from smaller angle with respect to the surface actually in case of optics this would have been 90 degree here I am, here I am starting from the surface as I go up up to a certain angle the beam gets totally reflected so this is total external reflection and beyond a certain angle it starts penetrating the medium beyond the critical angle what is known as critical angle critical angle and then the ray penetrates in the medium and the reflected intensity goes down intensity goes down so please be aware of this fact that I am measuring the angle with respect to the surface and because the refractive index n is less than 1 actually it is marginally less than 1 as I told you it is 1 minus delta where delta is around 10 to the power minus 5 for x-rays even lower for neutrons so this total external reflection takes place at a very very small angle up to a angle known as theta c which is very very small and the beam gets reflected and this is the principle of neutron guides I showed you photograph of neutron guides earlier and today also the neutron guide surface which is uh, nickel coated nickel coated nickel coated surface it reflects the beam and allows it to travel in vacuum we have to evacuate the nickel guides like you see light traveling in an optical fiber in that case it is through total internal reflection 
In neutron guides, it is total external reflection. Now, let us get back to the refractive index of X-rays. So, I will quickly try to give you how we derive the refractive index for X-rays. So, this is from our master's level course in plasma physics. The refractive index is gone by, given by omega p is the plasma frequency and omega square is the frequency at which we are calculating the refractive index. Now, in case of a collection, because X-rays, X-rays interacts, interact with charge cloud, electron cloud to be precise. I can write down this plasma frequency omega p square. I am not deriving it. I request you to accept it. This is all 4 pi e square rho e by m e. This is the plasma frequency. And then I can write n equal to 1 minus 1 upon omega square omega p square equal to 4 pi e square rho e by m e <coughs> so now I can write h cross omega is equal to e which is omega equal to h nu and I can find out omega to lambda because nu is 1 by lambda so h c by lambda this is equal to by changing omega to lambda I get the expression n equal to so it is n square so I get n equal to 1 minus lambda square by 2 pi e square by mc square rho e now this is because I wrote here n square n comes as to the power it is to the power half Assuming that this value is very small, equal to 1 minus epsilon, I can write down n equal to 1 minus half epsilon and that gives me n equal to 1 minus lambda square by 2 pi e square by mc square rho e. Now e square by mc square is known as Re, classical electron radius and is given by 2.818 femtometers. So I can write finally n equal to 1 minus lambda square by 2 pi r rho e r e where r e is the classical electron radius rho e is the rho e is the electron density. So, electron density is given by rho e for, a, for, for an atom let us say like nickel or for a single atom like co cobalt or anything you know if z i is the ith, ith atom charge number and n i is the number per unit volume then if I sum over all the atoms so it need not be one it can be many this is gives rho e power this is electrons electrons per unit volume number of electrons so this is rho e if you remember a similar thing i discussed with respect to suns, 
I discuss SLD scattering length density. We'll come to something similar later. So for X rays, it is one minus lambda square by two pi rho e r e. This is the value of refractive index for X rays. So it depends on the electron density and the classical electron radius.